All right, the, the question on the table is beyond conventional approaches to wellness, what are material ways to address burnout? The theme of the day. I like this question because it really does speak to the issue of taking care of ourselves as educators, as well as people who are responsible for helping students, promoting education and all of the other things that we do. The problem, of course, is that there are lots of recommendations out there for wellness strategies, which end up sounding sort of trite sometimes. Get enough sleep, exercise, get outside. We've heard all of those things. The situation falls apart, though, when it comes to asking people if they actually do it. Behavior change is hard. We know what we should do. We don't always carry through. And especially when we're dealing with either burnout or compassion fatigue, the two topics of this unit, with burnout, people feel overwhelmed by the demands on them. And our initial strategy is to try to do more. Let me just work harder and get through it. And with compassion fatigue, we've taken on the burden of other people's stress and again, feel like, well, I have to carry this. I can't take time out to care for myself because I'll be letting them down. So I actually put together four kinds of things I tell people. The first one is to rethink your assumptions. It's never the case that you're the only person there to help someone. And it is not the case that we have to be perfect at everything we do. So looking at what standards you're holding yourself to is part of dealing with burnout and well being. Reevaluating your goals. And I find that we're all struggling with this in the pandemic. The things we expected to do for research, teaching, service, our families, our holidays are different in a lockdown, and we need to consciously reevaluate those things. Recruiting support, and I'm speaking here to all of those people who are great teachers and hate to admit vulnerability and ask anyone else for help. This is not a time when we should all be going it alone. And then the question said a tangible strategy. And this is something I've been asking people to do for a while. Look at what is missing in your life or what is making you most stressed and find a hobby, a way to fill that gap. If you're talking to too many people online, take up something quiet like mindfulness training where you'll get solitude. If you're lonely because you're on the computer, then find a book club or some other social thing you can do online. If all your work is cognitive and there's nothing to hold in your hands at the end, take up a hobby that has something you can see. So the solutions I would say have mostly to do with rethinking things and looking clearly at what it is that you're lacking right now in your life. Kayla or Ben, do you have anything to add? Yeah, um, I think I think the one thing that I would add, Mary talked about rest, and um, you know, right now I think we need to be just a little bit more intentional about that what, about what that rest looks like. So um, our typical kind of cues of taking time off being on vacation, um, getting out of the house even, right? Those things aren't necessarily happening. Um, and even if we have just 30 minutes or an hour, uh, we really need to think through if we're doing activities that are distracting or if, act or if we're doing activities that are restful and going to help us recharge. Um, so just kind of being a little bit more intentional about what those practices are and what are the things that are draining versus um, kind of recharging is really important right now when everything is happening um, on the screens, everything is ha happening at home and there's not really much differentiation. And I think that connects to a, a question I'm seeing in the chat box about the um, how do we how do we deal with the overwhelming need or demand to, to stop the work all the time culture. Um, sometimes it's it's about permission or giving ourselves permission and a certain intentionality. Absolutely. I would say that that's the biggest piece is giving yourself permission, but also physically setting boundaries and letting people know when you are or are not going to answer email. Um, I think we should be setting packs with our coworkers. We shouldn't be sending each other emails at 10 at night. If you have a great idea, write it down, but send it in the morning. Stop implying that everyone should be working all the time and take the pressure off yourself as well. 
I, I might have interrupted Ben. Did you want to add something? No, that's great. I, uh, my team at uh, University of Washington in Seattle, we now have a rule that nobody sends an email after noon on Friday uh, if it can wait until Monday morning. And so we, we've tried to clear out that whole space. Um, within the confines of class, I think that you're talking, you've both talked about how people are switching their brains back and forth so often and, and so quickly. We've basically done 10 years of development of education in six months. In those 10 years of development, if we didn't have a pandemic, you would have been cutting a lot of stuff out of your syllabus. Like you'd have some good ideas, but you'd be taking things out. This is the time to just take an ax to it. If there's a if there's a thing you grade every two weeks and you don't have a great reason for it, cut it. Just cut, just cut, just cut and, and be absolutely brutal with how you pull things out of your graded work so that every teacher I've ever talked to in the world then takes extra energy and puts it into the things that they are really doing. But then you're switching less often between things and students appreciate having fewer categories of assignments as well. All right, so let's jump into round two. Kayla, how might we cultivate equitable and inclusive online learning experiences for our students? Can you please kick us off? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I think probably the most important and the first thing that I'll say is that I'm a huge fan of asking people what it is they need um, and what would be most helpful for them. So as much as we can include um, students in the discussion of how to cultivate these spaces, we should be doing so. Um, and it doesn't have to be a huge formal process. A lot of us are using Zoom or other things. It can just be a question in the chat, um, you know, or a Google form or something like that. What, what would make this um, more accessible, what, what would help it to feel like a safer space for you. Um, something I think else that's really important is acknowledging what is going on in the world. Oftentimes I hear, um, especially teachers kind of just feel really awkward sometimes about acknowledging what's happening, right? There, there's been a lot, um, you know, people have been murdered. There is the pandemic, there's a lack of resources and, and people just trying to, to navigate life in this moment in a way that's really challenging. Um, and sometimes we don't want to acknowledge because because it might make, make people feel bad, things like that. Uh, but the reality is that that makes people feel more alone. Um, so acknowledging what is happening is so important. That something has happened, even if we can't take a whole class period to address it, just letting, letting students know that it's on your minds, it's on your hearts, um, and, and that you know this is a place where, where we can think about that at least is really important. Um, creating spaces for reflection using different mediums can be really helpful. So some students want to talk about things kind of verbally. Um, others just need a little bit of space. Using the chat is a great feature for students to kind of engage um, in conversation. Um, and then also uh, setting clear boundaries for what is tolerated in your classroom or in your academic spaces is really important. So you are setting the tone um, for you know, whether this will be a safe space. Um, and no space is entirely safe all of the time, um, but you can set an intention about what kind of things are being, are going to be tolerated um, and check people on things when they are not, right? Even if you're not sure exactly what to say, noting that some people might've been uncomfortable with what was said, noting that something um, might've harmed, you know, some people in your class can be that first step just to acknowledge that something is happening. So people don't feel like they're going through it alone or they can't say anything um, or they're not protected, you know, in, in this space. Um, the other thing is to think about accessibility. And, and frankly, I think one of the, um, you know, silver linings of this is that we have been thinking a lot about how to include people who aren't physically present um, or, or who might need other things, but just honoring those things that people are coming up with um, and coming from a place of recognizing that people know what, know what they need. Maybe, you know, one student every once in a while is asking for something that they don't actually need, but the, the huge majority of the time, um, that's not the case. And so if we're thinking about being inclusive and being equitable, um, we can honor that people know what's best for them and they're doing the best that they can in this moment. And while on the topic of, of asking students directly, what they might need uh, and opening that line of communication. This is this is a, a, a perhaps a proper moment to plug that we do have a student panel 
later in the day uh, that is focused on how might we as institutions and also as educators in our classrooms support students better. We wanna hear directly from the students in our community. So um, there's that moment that we welcome everyone to, to join us in. Um, ben or Mary, anything, any, any remarks to weigh in on this one? Well, I wanted to say that I definitely agree with everything Kayla said, but I will do what I often do in therapy is bring out the elephant in the room. Sometimes it's hard to talk about diversity and inclusion when you're the white professor in the room. And that is common for me at UTSA because we are 52% Hispanic. So we are a minority serving institution. And what I do is what I've just done now, which is the meta comments. I will introduce a conversation and say, I'm not sure that I can speak to this or understand your position, so please tell me. And I'll tell you just a quick funny example. I was concerned about how to tell minority students about some of our programs that specifically provide support for them to go to grad school. Because I didn't want it to come off like I was saying, I don't think you can get there without extra help. So I asked a group of students on a Zoom meeting and one of the students of color, a young man started laughing and he said, Dr. MC, you're a white lady. There's no way you can say that without me thinking about it. But now that I know you asked, that's good. And I think that is what we have to be open to thinking about. And also admitting to them that we don't have all the answers on how to make this work in a regular classroom, never mind Zoom when we can't see everybody. And so I, again, I wanna reinforce what Kayla said about relying on people to tell us honestly if we treat them with genuine respect. Yeah, I, and I'll jump right on the end of that and just say that one of the ways you can respect people within the confines of the classroom is to really trust them with the why. So if you're doing active learning, it's not just that you're doing some active learning so that they will work, you did that because you wanted them to learn a certain thing. And then you did that because you want them to be able to do a certain thing. And then you did that because you want them to go on and be a certain thing. And those whys sometimes come across in the hallway after class, or they sometimes come across in in-person office hours. And since we don't have those, pump that why out. This is why I'm doing it. I believe that you are going to go on and be these things. So I'm trying to make you work now. It's not a cure-all for, for problems of diversity and inclusion, but it can really bring people into your mind in, in ways that are, that are being tested right now. Pump that why, even if it feels like you've said it two or three times, that repeated belief really shows that, that the person matters that you're talking to and, and you care about them more than just filing your grades at the end of the quarter, especially for big classes. Your why one time matters for hundreds of students. Can I add just one more thing quickly to that? I think um, I think Mary made a great point. The one caveat that I would make is that to the extent that you can make a statement that doesn't require caretaking, um, that can be really important. So in, you can say, um, I am feeling a little uncomfortable and I'm not sure it, you know, how to do this, but I think it's important. So I'm going to say something anyways, versus, um, you know, asking a question that, that then uh, requires students to kind of respond and, you know, say, oh, it's okay, or kind of affirm you. Um, just put it out there. This is happening, but I think it's important. So I'm going to try anyways. I love that. And I think it ties to Ben's why. When I asked that question, it wasn't for me to say, I feel uncomfortable. It was to say, here's why I'm telling you this and here's what I'm worried about and how can we solve it? And that, I always want the focus to be back on how is this gonna help the student? So it's a good distinction. All right, locking in the vote. Uh, question number two, what activities and tools are best for engaging students in remote learning environments? This has been a consistent topic and theme across every single event, regardless of what the focus of the event is. How do I keep my students engaged in an online virtual setting? Great, this is one I am very, very prepared for. Um, I've got three things for you. The first one is, if you're thinking about doing an activity in your class that won't help you when you come back to in-person, find something else. There are so many options of ways that you can do active learning. There's no reason to spend your time developing for an online environment if you don't think you'll be there after we have finished with this particular pandemic. 
you know, until we go back to the next one. So find things that will translate back to the classroom. That's really worth your time. Um, number two is there's no single right way to teach. So when you find one great activity, maybe you start putting that into five or six of your, say, 30 class sessions, but also be thinking of a different one. So if you're doing a lot of think pair shares, think pair shares are beautiful. They work online, they work in groups, they work in person, but also you can do a jigsaw or you can come back with some kind of polling question, or you can initiate a one minute paper or discussion. And because there are these multiple ways, they'll reach different students in different ways and at different points in their lives. So don't just go for one method. Um, there are great lists out there and I can throw some of those in the comments of, of some papers that have big lists of topics you can try. So something that translates back to in-person, um, some, something that's gonna allow you to use multiple modes. And then the biggest one is that you are asking students to do something. If you really want them to engage in an online environment, the thing that you're asking them to do has to reasonably be the thing that they might do in a career. So if you are asking students to analyze a test question that you've written and format their answer exactly how you want it in your blanks, well, they're not probably going to do that in a career. But if you're asking them to take, um, I'm a biologist, so I'll use biology examples. You want them to take a figure from a nature paper and try to see what the main variables are and, and why that figure matters. They're going to do that in their life. And it's easy then for you to start that chain of why's like, let's do this so we can get the points because we're doing an activity that's going to help you in your life. Now you're going to see more screens turning on. Just like if we were in person, you'd see more people moving down to the front row. So try to really hook it into things they're going to do, not the next prerequisite class, not just something for points. That across lots of professors, that's been the thing that I think is the most important of those three. And happily, defer to other answers here. Mary or Kayla, do you have thoughts? I was just gonna say, I would love to hear you talk about that for an hour because that's the kind of direct information on how to engage people that most of us aren't getting because our universities are so overwhelmed with sort of the basics of how to get on Zoom and link it to Blackboard and stuff that we haven't had those conversations. So. I don't have anything to add. I want to learn more about what you just said. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, you know, I'm not doing any teaching right now, but I'd love to hear you talk maybe a little bit more about the engagement and the screens piece. I saw a lot of questions in the chat about that. What does it mean when people don't have their screens on and how do you deal with that? Yeah, and, and that's, it's an interesting question that we're gonna have great scholarship on in five years for right now. The people who engage with me with their screens are different than the people that will engage with you or with the next professor or, or with somebody else. Um, I'm gonna go out of line here and answer a question that wasn't noted. One of the questions is how do we learn more about how to engage students? The one thing I can promise you is if you're in Manila or you're in Jamaica or you're down the street from me right now, within 10 miles from you, there is a great teacher who connects with students, not naturally but like consistently and quickly and thoroughly they might just be teaching in second grade don't be afraid to to look them up ask how they do what they do some of their tricks are going to translate and and whether it's in the k-12 system or they're teaching adult learners or or they're training people in office there are great teachers out there and if you know one of them don't be afraid if they don't have doctor next to their title, like go find them and ask them what their techniques are because they can, those things really come out in the online environments. Absolutely. And classroom management too. I come from a family of K-12 teachers and I go to them to ask how to manage college classroom issues because they've had a lot more training than most of us as faculty have on those issues. And I think that the one thing you mentioned before, Ben, when we were chatting was also about community colleges and looking to them as well. A lot of community college instructors have been teaching online since before the pandemic started. Um, and so using the resources around us to know what works and what doesn't can, yeah, can really be supportive and helpful. And I'd also like to say that I don't think faculty should assume that students who don't have the camera on and are quiet 
are not engaged. Some of them are having technology problems, which was noted in the chat. Some of them have social anxiety, don't want to watch themselves talking online. Some are afraid of being part of a recorded session. And some are embarrassed about where they live. And I have had students who never said a word in class turn out to give me some of the best answers on an essay or talk to me later. So we have to watch what we assume as well. Mary, I think I think it was you perhaps during the speaker call that shared um, a particular anecdote of, of um, noticing that a student was, you know, was was trying to connect in class and turn the camera on and seem to be in a, in a closet, doing so from a closet. I've heard other educators say students are backed into corners up against refrigerators uh, and connecting to your point that maybe sometimes we're all not comfortable turning our cameras on. That is in no way any indication that that, that that student is not trying to engage. In fact, that student may be jumping massive hoops and hurdles to, to be there, to be present in that moment in a way that's that's not distracting to others, but but also by by being there and tuning in. So um, yeah. I think that came from you. Yeah, I had a student who was watched my entire class from the pantry. And I think that was where there was a door, you know, in mm -hmm. her house in a multi generational home. The other part of that is I sometimes feel badly. Yesterday was my last lecture for my class and only about half the people were there at the synchronous time but we are recording and posting the lectures. And I know for a fact that a whole lot of my students are working in all of the jobs that are keeping the rest of us going during COVID, delivery stuff, grocery stuff, takeout food, some of them supporting family members. So I'm trying very hard not to take my usual idea, which is no one's coming to my lecture. What am I doing wrong? Why aren't they engaged? And think some of them are watching this in the middle of the night when they get home from work. And that's okay in a pandemic. Okay, so we are going to transition a little bit of time to uh, some of the live questions that we've been receiving and the questions particularly that have been upvoted. The, the ooh, oh, we just had one jump up. Um, all right, a question from Melissa for the panel. How do we still maintain deadlines and expectations but still respond to individual needs. How do we accomplish both of these things? I'm opening it up for the, for the panel. My students have given me mixed messages. Most of them want deadlines. If you make it too flexible, then they don't feel like they have to meet things, but they want individual consultation. And so I'm just handling it one-on-one. -on -one. I've set all the deadlines like I would during class, but I'm trying to be flexible when they reach out to me with individual issues. But I would do that even in class. I'm not hard nosed on some of those things. So I'm curious what other people say. I defer to you, Ben. <laughs> well, uh, I think that the biggest question for me when you say deadlines and expectations is whose. I know that a lot of professors are trapped between student expectations of what the professor is supposed to give them and administrative expectations of what they're supposed to be doing in their class. And if you're worried about administrative expectations, I really feel like this is a point where administrators, there's probably some things administrators should be doing and aren't doing them proactively. And if you find yourself in that situation, I think it is completely fair to ask an administrator or ask a chair and say, how am I going to be graded on my teaching in this pandemic? Because you give them an opportunity to say, we understand that this is a totally bonkers situation and we just want you to make the class happen. Just give students an opportunity, which can take a lot of pressure off for you. You might not have to do all the things that you do in a normal class, but if you don't start the conversation, an administrator has to be really proactive to come to you and say, you don't have to meet all of your criteria that you always did. Um, I think that's something for professors thinking about who is supervising them, or especially if you're on a tenure clock, you know, what kinds of pressures you're going to be under. And for students, the more you can streamline, if you ask for, I have a daily assignment, and I have exams, and I have one end of the quarter assignment, that's a pretty good, slim class. If over the years you've built up 
I have daily assignments and every third week there's a thing and then there's a reflection that only happens one time and then there's these other two assignments and this last couple of things that start, it starts to be harder for a student to hold your class all in one thought from an organizational standpoint. You might be able to streamline that in ways that help you, but also help students think, I have four classes, but my class with you means I do these things and they make sense. That can really take out a lot of the cognitive load, which takes off some of the pressure for deadlines and, and for the kinds of standards that students feel. Um, don't want to talk too long about that, but streamline it if you can. I think what I consistently keep um, hearing you speak to, Ben, is um, really focusing more on the, on the output. What are the objectives here? What am I trying to achieve? What is the why? And then, and then mapping that backwards and, and probably in the process, understanding that there are many different ways to achieve that to achieve that, that outcome, that, that objective, and ultimately that why. And it doesn't have to be the fixed paved path that we've been treading um, for many, many years, even before, before we've all gone virtual. But giving ourselves some flexibility in terms of the journeys we take to get to the objective and the why. Yeah, it's, it's one of the freeing parts about the fact that most education in higher education is actually not that good. By cutting a bunch of stuff that we all do habitually, we may really, really be improving it. Exactly. That's what I was going to say. As you know, the research shows most students don't remember lots of the trivia and the small details that we focus on. So rethinking what we expect. Someone in the chat asked earlier about how can you deal with one-on-one -on -one student issues in big classes. I know some people teach, teach larger classes, but I, I routinely teach 140 to 160. And I would say right now in my, um, my class, every exam, maybe I have six, seven students out of the 150 that need a special accommodation. I don't find that they take advantage of it. And, and maybe that's, I don't know, maybe, but, but to me, it hasn't been a hard problem to deal with students one-on-one -on -one when it cropped up. Okay, so there, there's another popular question here, and um, if we can be as, as quick as possible while giving it uh, its, due, its due time, I'd like to take the focus off the life part of work-life balance and redirect it to the work part, which I think is more within the purview of administration. What most of us need is not help with our hobbies, but help in the workplace. What specific demands can teachers make of administration to make our workload more bearable in the first place. Opening it up to our to our panel. Any thoughts on this one? Yeah, I'll jump in here as an administrator. Um, in, in part of my life, uh, one of the things we can do is we can make statements that make things very clear for instructors. Um, one statement that I feel like a lot of administrators are assuming is being said, but isn't actually being said is this is this is a unique time. This is not what it's going to be like in years. It hasn't been what it's gonna be like in years before. We do not expect the same kinds of outputs, the same kind of results from a uniquely challenging time. Keep the pipes open, but this, the experience is going to be different and tell instructors that they are not on the hook for doing the exact same thing they did before, just now in a harder environment. So I think that's one thing that administrators can and should do because they're all thinking it, but it's got to get into actual words. Um, there are places all around the country that are pausing tenure clocks or that are giving people credit in those kind of ways. If you're in that situation, that really matters. Um, another demand that you can make on administrators is you can ask them beforehand. You can say, will it be okay if I cut these parts of my class out? Because a lot of administrators are going to be happy to say, oh, you mean I get to make a decision that lowers your stress, probably lowers student stress, still gets the class taught, and I don't have to pay for it? You're giving an administrator an easy opportunity to help you make things simpler. And I, you shouldn't feel any guilt about that. I'm sure you'll pour your energy into some other part of teaching that'll be wonderful, because that's what people do. But, but let, let them help you take things out without any guilt on your point. I, I just know too many professors that are cutting things and then coming to me at the end of the quarter and saying, 
is it okay that I did this? Where I, three months ago, I would have told them, thank goodness you have this idea. Yes, of course. Uh, give your administrators chances to tell you that your job can be easier. And, and I, I think a lot of them want to. And tell them what we're facing. Be upfront with it. I go to meetings and talk about what students tell me and the stressors that I have on making the transitions and those things. We can't assume that they know. Um, and I think that's important. I want to address another question in the chat that's kind of related. It said, you know, what about people who, students who don't know how to ask for help? And I think that's part of back to Ben's why. After the first round of exams in my class, I personally emailed each student who hadn't done well or hadn't taken it and said, I am open to talking about what's going on and how we can work on it. So I think that faculty can set the stage in a classroom to let everyone know that that's an option. But I think if we're doing that for students, we have the right to expect that kind of support from administrators as well. We're all in this thing together. And you know, if we feel like their expectations aren't realistic, just like we want students to speak up, we should speak up. So we have about four minutes left, and there is one final question that did come from an attendee through the registration process, and the Coursero team voted on this question, making it uh, into, into this particular forum. The question is, how do we make sure that 2020 is not a lost year? What have we learned from it uh, that we can take with us into 2021 and beyond? Kaylee, you want to start? Yeah, certainly. Um, I can. I can start. I think, um, as I said earlier, one of the you know, silver linings of this is that we've learned a lot about how to be more accessible to a wider audience, um, and for people who cannot be physically present all of the time. And so I, I, you know, I hope and I pray that that this continues even when we go back in person. Um, as a person with a disability, traveling, conferences, all of those things are really hard for me, and I've been able to participate so much more more in this virtual format. So as we think about um, getting kind of post pandemic, I hope that we also think about how to incorporate some of these hybrid practices um, into that future and, and ways to make things even more accessible, right? Because we know that um, people are often not um, are, are not showing up because there are barriers and obstacles and not because they don't want to be there and put their best foot forward. So we've seen it and we've seen how quickly we can pivot. And I hope um, that we don't go back to business as usual in that way. Yeah, this is the future. I mean, every Star Trek you ever watched, they're like, oh, we have a big decision together. Let's look at somebody else on a screen on the other side of the galaxy and communicate and connect and do a thing. And now we're doing it. This is, we are going to look back at this in 10 and 20 years and say, oh, that was the year. It was awful. But this is where we started doing these things that we've been talking about doing video conferences for science for 30 years. And now we're finally doing it because we're humans and we have to get pushed. And I, I think if we're adding silver linings in here, it's that there are a huge amount of, of parts of higher education teaching that don't work well but students don't complain. There's a power relationship and they don't push like you would expect a, a customer in some other market. Uh, at, and now the pandemic has risen the level of stress and, and grown all these terrible outcomes, but it's also made us realize the parts of our teaching that work and the parts that don't. And the parts that don't, they can just, they don't have to go into 2021 or anywhere in the future. And, and that more than anything is gonna clear the way for better teaching better versions of classes, even really good instructors already are saying, oh, I, I guess I didn't need this stuff. And I see that as a, a really beautiful minor outcome compared to all the, the trauma that we're going through. I keep coming back to how resilient we all are, faculty, students. Can you imagine last Thanksgiving if we had told everybody that this is where we'd be sitting this year in lockdown, wearing masks, teaching on Zoom, we would have laughed. And we made the transition. It hasn't been easy and it hasn't been perfect. And I agree with prior comments saying that it wasn't perfect before. This is an opportunity for us to adopt the things that work well, to let go of some of the things that didn't work well for us. 
personally, I'm going to keep online office hours even when I'm back in the classroom because more students come and more participate. So we are learning from some of these things. But I'm also putting out a challenge, and this goes especially to those of us who are my age, but even those of you who are 30, 40, a little bit older. Our students in the classroom right now have been raised in a 24-hour media environment their whole lives where the messages are negative, a lot of doom scrolling, a lot of conversation about how bad things are. This is the place for us to step up. And I keep telling students, we made it through bad times before. We've made it through depressions and wars and other pandemics. And it's on us to offer some optimism and solutions and not to just find you know, that it's easier to be pessimistic and cynical. And so I'm challenging everyone, especially in classrooms, to be a voice of reason for students because often they don't have any life experience to say you get through bad things because they haven't ever had to experience them before. We, we talked uh, before this about kind of training in psychological first aid or mental health first aid. And I think that that's something as we're thinking about things to ask admin for or demands, that's, that's something that everyone, uh, Mary, you were saying could be trained in or should be trained in. Um, and just like how to better support other people is not something that we necessarily know how to do, but so many people are being tasked with and will be tasked with in the future. And this is a place where we could stop and get a little bit more info on how to do it and how to do it well. I'd like to just address one comment in the chat because it resonates and I think it's so real. Someone said, well, I don't feel really resilient. And that's the point. Resilient doesn't mean that you are comfortable or perfect. It means you give yourself credit for still hanging in there and still trying and still being there for your students. And I think that comes back to what, what Ben and Kayla both said about looking at your expectations. You don't have to be a perfect teacher in a really strange situation. You're doing the best you can. And that's what I see as resilience. I think when you're living through tough times, you never know if you're doing it right. Historically, we'll look back, but we're definitely still moving ahead I, I've asked people, what would have happened if this pandem pandemic had happened 20 years ago before the internet and Zoom? Would we have just lost an entire year of education from K through college? I think so. The fact that we've even kept going, to me, is a testament to people's strength. Mm 